You're listening to Nutrition Matters Podcast with Paige Smathers, Registered Dietitian Nutritionist. Nutrition Matters Podcast explores how to approach food and your body in a whole new way. I interview people who share stories and expertise in rejecting diet culture, making peace with food, and discovering a more positive, realistic, and sustainable approach to health and well-being. I'm Paige Smathers, Registered Dietitian Nutritionist and owner of Positive Nutrition, an in-person nutrition therapy practice in Salt Lake City, Utah. I offer free resources, including this podcast, a blog, and posts on social media. If you're local to Salt Lake City, check out our services and availability for appointments and keep your eyes out for in-person groups on mindfulness, intuitive eating, body image resilience, and more. Go to positive-nutrition.com and hit subscribe if you'd like to keep in touch. I also offer online courses covering topics like the science of nutrition, mindfulness, and healing your relationship with food. Check those out at positive-nutrition.com slash academy. If you like what you hear on the podcast, you can make a difference by leaving a review, sharing with friends and family, or making a donation. Thank you so much for your support. You can also find me on Instagram or Facebook if you'd like to have a little more food for thought at Paige Smathers RD. Thank you so much for listening. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Nutrition Matters Podcast, and thanks so much for joining me. My name is Paige Smathers, and I'm your host, and I am super pumped to share this podcast episode, which is a part two of a a previous episode that Linda Tucker and I recorded together and released last September. Uh, The title of that part one episode is Exploring Enoughness in Eating and Beyond, and this is kind of a follow-up to that exploration of the concept of enoughness. And I just really, really enjoyed our conversation originally. I enjoyed this follow-up so much. There's so many nuggets of really important insight here that Linda shares, and I'm really excited to share it with you. So just a quick reminder for anyone who wants to become a supporter of the podcast at $5 a month, you can do so via the show notes. There's a link in there. Um, It's just two clicks. You don't have to sign into anything. You don't have to download anything. And your podcast feed will automatically get populated with the subscriber-only content, which will have a monthly nutrition lesson, a monthly guided meditation, and a monthly Q&A episode with me. All of the episodes that you hear, uh, like interview format on this podcast will remain free here. But if you'd like to be a part of helping me continue uh, putting out these episodes for free if you can and if you're willing and able to support at a $5 a month level. That would be so, so, so fabulous and appreciated. Um, this month's nutrition lesson, I talked about exploring weight loss myths. And last month, I did a whole exploration of the concept of emotional eating. And I plan to do some some more really interesting and hopefully helpful nutrition lessons each month uh, for people who support the podcast. So just click in the show notes and it's two clicks from there if you are interested in helping to support the podcast. And thanks so much in advance for considering it. All right, with that, let's get into talking with Linda Tucker all about wounded healers, shame spirals, vulnerability, motivation. We talk about all these really cool concepts that I think will resonate um, for for you, no matter kind of where you are on your journey with this stuff. It's it's a really it's a really insightful conversation. And thanks so much for being here. And I hope you enjoy it. Hi, Linda. Welcome to welcome back to Nutrition Matters podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me back. I'm thrilled to be here. Me too. So everybody will hopefully remember our last episode. Um, It's not that far back in the archives. I was actually just going to look up to find out what the number was. Do you remember off the top of your head? I don't. Um, I don't okay. remember, and I just re-listened to it. Okay. I think it. I think we recorded it th- oh, in July, it's but it didn't air until like one fifty-eight. The- yeah. I so it this aired was in like September. Yep, September twenty third, one fifty eight. Exploring enoughness and eating and beyond. And um, Linda and I, we just decided it would be a lot of fun to get back together and kind of do a part two of this idea, just because first of all enoughness is a huge con it's a huge concept and I think we both had experiences where talking about it and really exploring it together kind of 
was really just interesting from our own perspectives and just kind of got us thinking more about this concept. And so as, after talking about it back and forth for a couple months, we were like, let's do it again. Let's let's talk. Let's kind of record a part two and, and share some of the behind the scenes of what happened with us. Mm-hmm. And then any additional thoughts we have about this concept. So I highly recommend all the listeners, if you haven't listened to that one yet, um, go ahead and pause and listen to episode 158 and then tune back into this one. Sound good, Linda? Yeah. Yeah. It's. I think it's when I went back and re-listened to it, it was – it was really helpful to, for me to frame it as like, these are two, first of all, human beings. Yeah, first <laughs> Second of all. Second of all, like helping professionals that are just having a conversation as colleagues about this idea. I think it's like, we're not claiming to have the answer. We're not claiming to like, even know exactly 100% how to help people with it. But I think it was, I stand by the idea of it's important to talk about. Yeah. And it's so interesting because the fear of not saying it right or not doing enough or not knowing enough is like kind of what both of you were, both of us were experiencing. But then it's also yeah. ironic because it's like that's the exact topic of what we're talking about, you know? <laughs> the irony is not lost on right. me. Right. Me neither. Means. Yeah. It's, yeah. It was, it was a really interesting experience to have the, um, conversation about enoughness trigger a I'm not enough shame spiral. <laughs> yeah. So do you want to talk about that? Like just kind of share yeah. what happened for you on your end with recording that. So, I mean, I think it's important to like, we, we had we had these friendly conversations and we had kind of had these interactions on, in, on Instagram about this term enoughness and how I was really grappling with it and trying to figure out how to bring that concept into my coaching. And you were like, let's talk about it. And I was like, yeah, let's talk about it. And then after we finished recording it, I felt great. I was like, wow, that was so lovely to spend time with like a like-minded professional. And then the stories started coming into my head of the, what if, what if this, what if that, what if I didn't do this well enough? What if people are going to have a problem with this? And I really went into a pretty (laughs) intense shame spiral about it. And I reached out to you and I have to just give Paige so much credit for her skilled and compassionate way of holding space for me in that shame spiral, which is, well, I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit more later, but that is such a key component of shame resiliency is having people like that, that you can talk to about it. So she really kind of talked me off a ledge a little bit and we decided that I was just going to sit with it, which is always a great thing to do. Well, and I also warned you that this would happen, right? You did. And I, so I I just so that people know, I'll be fine. Yeah, that's part of like my spiel that I say to everybody before recording is is I I do have like a little thing I say to everybody and one of the things that I include in it, before we even start recording is it is very normal for you to hang up from this call and start questioning yourself and start like even thinking like gosh, I'm such an idiot. We need to re-record that. That was so dumb. Who I think I am like So I try to let people know that's super normal. And then what tends to happen is you go back and listen and you're like, oh, that wasn't so bad, right? So you, I had already kind of warned you, but then it still happened in full force. Yeah. And I think looking back in retrospect now, I can kind of see what happened, which is um, I, I think this was the first time I'd really publicly spoken about something so nuanced and so hard to define. I think I, I've, po- I've talked on other podcasts or given presentations or written about things that have been published publicly, but about intuitive eating or health at every size, basically food and body image recovery stuff, which I feel really um, – clear because I have a lot of practice doing that. I think where I didn't have a lot of practice is talking publicly. Now I've been talking about these things in, in client sessions for a long time and in my own therapy, but not publicly. And I think it was just that fear of like opening up this really vulnerable part of myself of like this vulnerable topic. And I was just terrified that someone was going to, um, not understand my intention or not, you know, it was just, it was just a vulnerability hangover. And you did warn me about that. I think I was just a little (laughs) arrogant to be like, I'm sure it'll be fine. You know? Yeah. And, and it doesn't always matter if you get warned or not. I'm yeah. Like you're still going to respond and react the way that you do. So it's okay. It's just, it was just so interesting on my end. I was like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I know. I know exactly what's going on. I've done this hundreds of times at this point and it's, it's unreal. Like what happens 
on the other side, um, especially like you said, when you're talking about topics that are more nuanced, uh, that are more um, tender and or if if topics aren't as much talked about publicly, like like there's certain topics within the health at every size or intuitive eating world that you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard that like a bajillion times, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're trying to kind of tackle a new frontier or like, hey, but what about this? Or can we talk about it this way in a way that's like a little bit unfamiliar to the to yourself, but also maybe even like the dialogue uh, at large, that's, that's also mm-hmm. really scary. And I think we did a little bit of that. Yeah. I mean, we touched on it a little bit where we talked about, you know, owning your own business can bring up a lot of like enoughness struggles. Um, and I think that was part of the, that was like a tip of the iceberg. And so, so, so we had this conversation over the weekend, you invited me to sit with it. I said I would. And then just coincidentally, I had a supervision, professional supervision appointment on Monday, which this is when I get to do my like ringing endorsement of professional supervision, because, I don't know how I could continue to do this work in a way that felt really um, nourishing and brave and, you know, as harm reducing as possible if I wasn't in not only my own therapy, but my own professional supervision. So I had this appointment on Monday just coincidentally, and we really broke we went through kind of each story I was telling myself one by one and fact checked it. And I processed the emotion of it. And that was such an important thing for me to do because it that was in July of last year and really since then I've been dismantling and processing and sitting with and challenging these stories of enoughness and shame that I don't even think I fully realized were there until wow. I recorded that podcast with you. So, wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a big deal. Thank you for trusting me and my listeners, our audience with with that part of you that's so tender and vulnerable, that's a big deal. Well, th- thank you for saying that. And it, it feels it feels so good to talk about it openly. I've talked about it privately with a couple friends or colleagues and everybody's saying the same thing of like, me too, I feel that way too. I feel like we need to be talking about this more. And it's through supervision that I've been able to explore. Um, and, and I was having these conversations prior to when we recorded the podcast. I think this touches on something that I really wanted to discuss with you today, which is where I was with my coaching business, whereas I've been doing this intuitive eating and health at every size coaching for a few years. And with time, it gives me perspective of, okay, what are the common issues? Like what is kind of everybody saying, but in different ways. And one of the things that I think I was realizing, which even spurned the episode on enoughness is the secondary hump of, okay, I've decided to pursue intuitive eating or explore that a little bit more or heal my relationship with body shame and all those kinds of things as much as we can ever fully heal it. Um, and then they run into the roadblock of, I'm not even doing this right. Have you ever, do you experience that a lot, Paige? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was, I was having these conversations with clients I've been working with for six months or a year or a year and a half or two years. And it was kind of this like two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. And my job was really to kind of hold space for the idea of there is no way that you're doing this wrong. You know, you're just doing it and you know how we have shame stories about our shame. And so I was really doing that in my professional work. I think what I hadn't been doing such a great job of of was doing it in my own personal life. And again, I think my experience was reflecting my client's experience, which this is like the beauty of the client, you know, professional relationship is that we're always like mirroring each other. And this idea of I can intellectually understand something and even have a lot of practice at it, but it's doing the embodiment work. It's dropping out of my head and getting into my body and really feeling the feelings and processing those feelings that I was gently, (laughs) but very clearly invited to do more of. Yeah. Okay. So what was that? What was that like for you? And what came up as you, as you did that? Well, what came up was, oh, this, uh, this is shame. I mean, this is why I have such the luxury of talking about it and working with the, the idea of shame for so long is that when I was able to name it, it took away a lot of the power. Um, but I think it, it was a really startling thing for me to name what I think we commonly refer to as like 
perfectionism or imposter syndrome or anxiety or fear. And those, those, all of those words are valid and they all explain different facets of it. But if I was really to kind of get into my body and feel the feeling and process it out loud, um, it really came down to shame, which is the incredibly uncomfortable feeling of being at risk for not being accepted or loved or belonged or, um, you know, a part of the group. So we can experience it in the moment. Like I am feeling like I am out of the group. I am feeling like I am at risk of being unaccepted or not belonging. Or it can even be the, like, I anticipate in the, that, that in the future, this may happen. It's like the fear of shame or it's the actual experience of shame. And I don't think I had, I don't think I had really named, named it as shame up until that point. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a really powerful thing to be like, okay, I know this shame resiliency dance. Like I've done it around food. I've done it around body. Now I'm being invited to do it around, um, identity, career, work. Um, I love that. Linda, that's such a good point that I just want to highlight for a quick second. Um, the idea of your ability to recognize like, okay, this is a skill. This is the, I have the tools because I've, look at the, look at the things I've done in the past. Look at the hard things I have wrestled with and come out on the other side feeling a sense of clarity or whatever it is that you feel. Mm -hmm. And the ability to, to notice that and to be like, okay, what can I draw? What skills do I already have that I could draw from here? I think that's what makes working on your relationship with food so meaningful is mm-hmm. that ability to to then say, okay, I have I have some really cool skills. How can I apply them with, like you said, like career, identity, relationships, those types of things. So that's awesome that that's how that felt for you. I've noticed yeah, that in myself too. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, and what's funny is that I've heard other people say this, right? I've heard other mentors and trusted people that I have in my life talk about how it's sort of like whack-a-mole, you know, like you'll feel really good about it in one area of your life and then something will change and then you won't feel so great about it or, you know, and I was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I was like nodding along and I was like, yep, yep, yep. Oh yes. I'll be on the lookout for that for sure. And then the reality is, is like when it hits, it hits and we can't intellectualize something that needs to be felt emotionally. Does that make sense? Oh my gosh. Yeah. No, and I, I, ugh, I've been thinking about that a lot too. I think a lot of, a lot of my clients will tell me that they feel this disconnect between that intellectual understanding versus actually believing it or actually doing it. Right? There, that's a mm-hmm. question that comes up a ton. So I'm interested in your, in your thoughts on that, just in and of itself. Yeah, I mean, hands down, that's probably where I spend the most amount of time working with people. So I would say the majority of the people that I work with are people that have some exposure to intuitive eating, health at every size, body acceptance work, right? It's very rare that I'm working with someone who this is completely brand new. And I like working with people like that, actually. Part of me wishes I worked with a, a little bit more people that are brand new to the idea because I feel like if I gave them the gift that I had, which I talked about on the last episode, which is like framing this intuitive eating diet recovery work with like kind of all the myths and misconceptions out in front so that they kind of know what to look out for. It can save them a lot of time and pain. Um, But the reality is most of the time people don't seek out support until they've been trying it and are kind of feeling stuck. And that's where I am right now is I'm revamping some of my programs and some of my language and some of my offerings, really targeting this, this audience of people that are like, I've been working on this for a while. There's things I love about it. Maybe they've gone through kind of like the honeymoon phase and they were feeling really good. And then for some reason they feel stuck and they just kind of say, this isn't working anymore. I'm not feeling any better. I'm actually feeling worse. And part of that I think can come from when we take away some of our numbing behaviors or, you know, coping mechanisms that were kind of distracting or avoiding us from some of these feelings, we can feel a little bit more overwhelmed and a little bit more emotional. So I think some of it's very normal, but I think some of it is also, we, we tend to then use this kind of perfectionistic diet mentality towards recovery. 
And I was finding that a lot with people of like, I'm not, I'm, I didn't have a good intuitive eating day today, or I was doing intuitive eating for a while and then I'm not doing it anymore. Or I was feeling really good in my body and now I'm not. And, yeah. and they, they were like layering on the shame of like, and now I can't even do this right. I must really be broken because everybody else, and I'm sure you hear this page. It's like everybody else seems to be doing it right. And I'm not doing it as good as they are. Yeah, for sure. There's, and, and that's such a problem in general, but especially in our world of like, everybody's getting the just snapshots through social media, it can, it can Mm -hmm. feel intensified just with what you're seeing all the time online. Yeah. And that's the great part of me working with clients is that I have this like nonstop instant feedback of people saying what they really like seeing content of and what they don't really like seeing content. And, you know, I can't give it I think it's good that there's all kinds of content out there. You know, I don't think that everybody needs to be saying the same thing. If anything, I think we need to be diversifying a little bit more so that people can find whatever help they need at whatever stage they're in. But I think some of the time, I think we're so excited to talk about the benefits or the um, quote unquote success that people are having with this work that the unintended consequence can be re unintentionally reinforcing this, idea of doing intuitive eating right or doing body image recovery work right or doing shame resiliency work right. And I was, I was really, I was already sensing that back and forth. And then I think it took seeing it in my own personal life and living through it in my own emotional way to be like, Oh, and and that's why supervision, the, the person I do it with, she's so skilled as you were Paige of like, don't you see we're, we're doing, we're falling into the same traps as professionals of like, we've got to be the perfect coach or the perfect dietitian or the perfect intuitive eating professional. And we can never say anything wrong and we can't have, and what that does is it it doesn't actually help the work. Yeah. But so totally. And also to be fair to you and your, you know, feelings in this process, there's also some real intensity around doing it the right way. I mean, there is so much rhetoric around like this person's in because they do that and this person's out of, of, you know, doesn't, I don't know. It's not really like a in out thing, but there's a vibe of that. There's, there's rhetoric about that. And so, I mean, to be fair, I see where you were coming from because there's a lot of there's just a lot of black and white thinking in this space, in my opinion. I completely agree. And I think the word that and where I've really settled and started to dig in and get curious around is this idea of like harm reduction, Um, really taking a harm reductionist approach to um, recovery work, you know, all of this, because uh, and this is where Brene Brown's work on shame is so great, because she's like, shame is inversely correlated with things like addiction and eating disorders and, you know, like shame perpetuates these things. So if we think shame is the motivation to change for the quote unquote better, we're kidding ourselves. Yes. But what, what we do need more of is accountability. And that's that fine line of like, we need to be accountable for what we're saying and the maybe potential harm that we're causing while also holding space for these the truth of we're never going to do it perfectly and our fear of doing it perfectly or our striving to do it perfectly actually either makes us freeze and not do anything or it makes us kind of lash out and get defensive and get um, black and white and binary. And I think that there's a place for, you know, holding people accountable and calling a spade a spade and also compassion for ourselves and for other people that, um, you know, we're all, we're all trying and really this idea, there's something that we talk about sometimes in these communities. And I'm sure you've heard it before page of like being reachable and teachable. So, you know, as professionals and there's so much diet culture out there and there's so much stigmatizing language and problematic companies, and we will burn ourselves out if we're constantly trying to put out every fire that we come across and say everything perfectly and respond perfectly. But we do need to be mindful of the amount of energy and time we have and and really focus on the people and systems that are reachable and teachable. And I think I need to do that with myself too, you know? Yeah. I need, 
I need to be reachable and teachable. Yeah, for sure. And I'm as you're saying that I'm envisioning somewhat of like a spectrum of like maybe maybe each community needs people who are who are willing to willing and able to like do a lot of that calling out work and maybe maybe they have a different capacity for the compassion if if we were to set up that spectrum which is probably an unfair binary because you can probably have both you know at the same time but it, it's just it's I think my opinion is that we just we have to stay true to ourselves in the process of challenging diet culture right stay true to mm-hmm. your temperament um what feels right to you and 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 authentic to your what you want to put out in the world um and and that's coming from personal experience of feeling like you know as we talk about enoughness it's it's challenging to have a podcast it's challenging to put yourself out there especially in a world that um you know rightfully so like probably there's an element of like I I I don't know always how much I should be in the center (laughs) or or why should I have such a such a platform you know there's like there's elements of like ooh this feels kind of I don't know kind of strange but at the same time I, I feel this kind of level of all right you're not doing that enough you're not doing this well enough you're not talking about this enough you're you know and I personally and I I'm okay with a discussion about this because I could have this wrong for sure but I I've had to sort of get really honest with myself about what am I trying to do and what is true to me and kind of it's okay for there to be different voices out there meaning my voice isn't going to sound just like someone else's voice and even though there are people who are you know potentially not happy about that like I in the end feel better with myself when I'm authentic to me while also remaining accountable, being willing to learn, knowing that I am for sure constantly evolving in my own work. But at the same time, that that feeling of not being enough isn't going to stop me from trying to, to be a force for good in the world, even if, if it's imperfect. I feel like I was just rambling there. Tell me if no. did any of that makes sense. <laughs> oh, I love that. I think it's so, I think it really, I think I agree a hundred percent. And I really, um, that was one of the things that I struggled with after my last appearances. Like, I just wonder if I'm giving enough, uh, airtime to the amount of inherent, you know, privilege and bias that I bring to the table because I am a human being that exists in a, you know, oppressive society, right? It's, it's a, it's something I struggle with. And I think that's kind of what you were, you were talking about too. But I think where I've gotten a lot of clarity and education around is like shame and guilt and fear being motivators to do anything will ultimately not be sustainable or health promoting or change promoting. Yes. And so I have to constantly do the work. So it's the same thing. If we take it all the way back, you know, on the timeline to like when I was first healing my relationship with food and the, and how I work with people around healing their relationship with food. And one of the core principles of intuitive eating is, you know, reject the diet mentality, which is essentially reject shame and fear and guilt as your motivator to do anything, right? It's like, this is, this is about curiosity and experimentation and growing and changing and being open. And, and so, and then, you know, we get into like the shame story stuff around the story I'm making up, which is one of the, you know, one of Brene Brown's great lessons of like using that language. And so I think there can sometimes be a tendency to fall into fear as a motivator because this work can feel so scary sometimes. Um, but also being like, if, if that's my motivation, if shame or guilt or fear is my motivation, it's eventually going to fizzle out. So actually what the best long-term motivator is, is self-compassion and knowing what's going to trigger my shame stories, naming them, questioning them, talking about them out loud, and then moving forward. I think it really came down to me with, um, this idea of, I need to like fix myself and like 
I remember saying in supervision one time, like, I just know I have all of these blind spots and I'm just terrified of the harm that they're going to cause. So can you just tell me all my blind spots? <laughs> and I was like, kind of joking. And she was like laughing, but she was like, it doesn't get to, you doesn't work that way. It, you don't get to operate that way. So you better get used to discomfort. And that's what I was thinking while you were talking page of like, we're talking about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. If that's, if I'm hearing what you were saying correct. And me getting comfortable with being uncomfortable is what I need to do to help move this work forward. Yeah. I, I mean, that's like the name of the game in my adult life, I think, is just instead of thinking discomfort means wrong, it's just – Right. It's It just is. It's, it's first of all, like the only sure thing of life is there's going to be discomfort here, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And – it's not it doesn't mean you're doing it wrong or bad it doesn't mean that you are wrong or bad it it's just it's it just is what it is it's just a cue it's just something going on and you can look at it or you can develop a different relationship with discomfort like you said you can become more comfortable with discomfort you can become more confident that you can feel discomfort and still do what matters to you yeah yeah, I can I can create a social media post that I know may not be perfect, but I've spent a long I've spent a lot of time and energy trying to word it in the best way possible and people still may not like it. And if I if I'm in alignment with my values, I will be able to either hear the call out that I need to hear and change my behavior or hear the um disagreement from people that disagree with me and not have it knock me down and not be able to get back up again. Right. It's, it's, it's both of those things. Me, me being tolerant of discomfort helps me hear the messages I need to hear to be able to grow and change because I am perfectly imperfect and I am seeing the, the world through a filtered lens of a lot of different biases. And so I'm so grateful that I'm able to hear things that are like, okay, that doesn't feel great to be called out on that, but I know I needed to hear it and I'm going to do better because I know better. And also it helps me be resilient to the people that I know are not aligned with health at every size. And so I go, I get it. You don't agree with me. I'm not going to change my mind. So it sounds to me like over the last months that you've been thinking about this concept that you actually went through what we were talking about earlier, that concept of going from the intellectualizing of something of of shame and of vulnerability and of um, enoughness and really like brought it out of your head and like into your body that that to me sounds like an example of of one way that you've done that over the last few months does that seem fair totally fair and I think I have to give myself I have to frame it as like I don't think I would have been able to process it without probably a couple years of intellectualizing it beforehand. And I had had bits and yeah. pieces of feeling it, you know, like I had, I had been dipping my toe in this work. I mean, I had been getting supervision and I had been really having, you know, important conversations around. I've always framed my work since I've been doing intuitive eating and health at every size work through the lens of like, this is a social justice issue. So I've been having these harder conversations around identity and privilege and bias and, um, trauma and all of those things. So it wasn't that like, this was the first time I ever confronted it. I think it was, yeah. yeah, right. I think it was the first time that I was maybe like publicly making myself, um, available for, (laughs) I don't know, like, uh, you know, I I was having, like I said at the beginning, I was just having the conversation about something that I was like, hey, this is something I've been grappling with. I don't really know um, the answers, but I'm, you know, I think it's important. And I think it it was a powerful lesson for me to be like, okay, now you need to actually feel all those feelings for real, for real about it. Um, You know, there's a word that I've been throwing around is like surrender. I think I needed to fully surrender to the feelings of shame I have around 
you know, my work, my, not only like my tangible business work, but the work that I'm trying to do in the world and, and all the things that come with that, which is loneliness and belonging and criticism. And it's not really my, it, you know what it was? I think it was Paige. Now that I'm kind of talking through this with you, it's like, I needed to feel the shame of kind of centering my own feelings in that and being like, of course I did. And also that's not helpful. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that that's self-compassion, right? Right. The right. of course I did is, is sometimes all it takes. I mean, not, not to oversimplify self-compassion, but sometimes it feels like this huge concept and people are like, what does it mean? So you're saying if shame doesn't motivate and I should try to cultivate self-compassion, like what does that even look like? And, and, I really think it looks exactly like that. It's it's saying, well, of course I did that. Well, of course that came up for me, and and it's okay, and it makes sense, and I'm I'm okay, right? Just kind of those mm-hmm. simple little validations you can give yourself is is a really potent example of self compassion, in my opinion. Yeah, and I I've been toying around. I've been studying kind of internal family systems, which I thought was really interesting, and nonviolent communication, which I thought was really interesting, and then recently gotten into like. ACT act therapy, and they're all kind of saying the same thing. And I think if I go back and look at intuitive eating and health at every size and shame resiliency and self-compassion, they were saying it too. But sometimes you don't know, you can't see, you know, I'll go back and read the same book three times and each time I'll catch something different. And so I think I was just this time around, this time around the shame spiral, I caught, of course you feel this way. Rather than like, yeah. oh, you feel this way and that's something because, to feel bad about. And this means about you, right? They're, yeah. Like kind yeah. of that ability to just stop the story and say like, okay, yeah, like of course. And it doesn't mean anything about my worth, about who I am, about my ability to do my job. It just It just is what it is. It's part of the territory. Yeah. And again, I've been working on that idea with clients, you know, around – they want to control their body or shrink their body. And I've always validated them with like, of course you do. Like we live in a system that is stigmatizing and biased towards people's body sizes and you want to feel safe. And I know that that's what you want. And I've always been able to hold space for other people around this, but you know, it's like the shoemakers kids don't have any shoes, right? Like I don't think I had done a really embodied job of doing that for myself. I think I was talking the talk and sometimes walking the walk, but I really need to have, I needed to have a fall down on my knees, like, you know, surrender moment of I am going to continue on the shame spiral until I just understand that, you know, of course I'm going to feel, we live in a patriarchal, capitalistic, white supremacy, misogynistic, you know, culture that's going to tell me I'm not doing it right all the time. And while sometimes that is true and I need to do better, I also don't need to carry around, um, you know, the burden of shame with me wherever I go. That's, that's really well just... said. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Have you had more shame spirals since then? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, yes, I think so I can think of one example specifically that actually had nothing to do with my work. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, you like, don't need to share if you don't want to. Just... Well, no, but I'm just saying it's like this comes up because I think the ultimate answer to this is sort of what I alluded to in the last podcast, but I don't, I don't think I had the life experience to be able to articulate it as clearly of like, it's always going to be around what are people going to think they're not going to like me. Yeah. <laughs> what is my identity? You know, so I've had situations around boundaries around my time or social interactions or family obligations or travel where I've had to like create boundaries. And I think I was good about creating boundaries in the past. I've always, I've been working on boundaries for a long time, but I think if I was really honest with myself, I still felt a little nugget of shame around it of like, I know I need to set this boundary. I know it's the best thing for me. And I also feel, you know, shame has two voices, which are, uh, you're not enough. And that one, I think I, I think I can sense, I can feel that really easily now, which 
reminds me, I'm going to write a note. I want to talk about interoceptive awareness. I think I can feel the you're not enough voice of shame pretty clearly. I think the one that surprised me that I actually felt shame about feeling was the who do you think you are voice. Mm. Which came up after the podcast, right? Yes. Yes. I have that voice a lot too, just owning it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So the who do you think you are around boundaries voices, like I don't actually disagree that I need to set boundaries and I'm willing to do it. I do still battle the voice of like who do you think you are. Yeah. Yeah. Because of privilege and because of all the things that I have, there's this sort of like belief of like, Um, you know, I get my identity through helping people or it's for the work or there are people that have it worse than me, which is true. You know, all of these things are true. And that's why I think they make really enticing shame stories. Um, but the fact of the matter is I I can't operate from a place of shame. It's just not helpful to anybody. Right. Well, that's, that's exactly what I was going to point out is something can be true, but not necessarily all that helpful. Right. Mm -hmm. So I find it, I find it really helpful to kind of when I'm having that shame story spiral go on for myself is is kind of differentiate between truthfulness versus helpfulness and kind of say, okay, like, let's zoom out. Where am I trying to go? How do I like what's going to help me get there? Can I let go of of this thing that's eating away at me right now? Just in the name of like, well, it's just not all that helpful, you know? And yeah. there are things that are true and helpful too, right? Yeah, and I think <laughs> so. that's where this idea of like the the core of shame can be like oppression is real, you know, inequality is real, um, injustice is real, and I can I can't motivate myself from shame to fix it. I can only motivate myself from self compassion and compassion for others, yeah, right? Yeah, like I love the that. The root problem is the same, so. In, in what's I, this is the paradox, right? This is the, the paradox of permission and intuitive eating means it's kind of like once you legalize all things without morality, you're then free to choose what makes you feel best, right? And what you like and what you have access to. Um, same with body image stuff. It's like once we, once we stop creating a hierarchy of bodies and morality around body size and start looking at the systems of oppression for what they are, you can choose to wear makeup or not, or, you know, whatever, like there's no judgment, whatever, whatever you choose to do when we understand that it's the systems that are broken, not individual people. Um, that was really helpful for me understanding this idea of like, you know, I can still, the the thing can still be true, but I can choose how I respond to it. And if I'm coming from a place of not enoughness and feeling stuck and, you know, my therapist once offered this to me and I've, I've offered it to a few other people and it always resonates. It's like this idea of, um, who do you think you are often can really masquerade as noble And one of the ways that it can do that is it can take on the voice of, um, well, I guess if God's not going to fix it, it's up to me. Right. And, and while that's true and it helps me, I am really passionate about social justice work and I am really passionate about helping people, but I'm also not going to be the, I'm not fully responsible for every system of injustice in the world. And and if I try to make myself be, I'm going to burn out. Yeah. 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 Very true. Oh, burnout is a real thing. Okay, but you wanted to talk about interoceptive awareness. Let's, let's yes. talk about that. Okay, so let's talk about that because that was key for this whole idea. So what, what, what is it? Go ahead. And start so off interoceptive yeah. awareness, like kind of, you know, it's basically like the ability to sense what's going on in our body. For that's a really oversimplified term, but it's it's the ability to like sense a full bladder or to sense, you know, hunger, which could be in your stomach, but can also be in a lot of other places. It's a really critical baseline skill that we talk a lot about in intuitive eating, which is like, can you feel the sensations in your body? And for some people, we take that for granted. For some people, they really can't, or the, the, signals are so subtle. And so it's really like learning like what's potentially blocking them or how can we learn how to better sense the feelings in our bodies. That's really crucial, especially when it comes to emotional processing things, because I think I was really good at feeling physical sensations in my body, like hunger, like desire, like sleep, like those things that really helped me kind of get the nuts and bolts of like my physical self-care. 
better. And I was starting to get better about learning like how my emotions might show up like a stomach ache or like a racing heart or like tension in my neck. And I started to have some awareness around, okay, well, what's the emotion that I could be feeling there? And then the more interesting part, I think, is is saying, okay, there's interoceptive awareness and then there's interoceptive responsiveness of once you can feel what's happening in your body, do you then know how to get the needs met around that? And that was really a game changer when I heard the addition of like, interoceptive responsiveness. And that's where I think shame keeps people stuck because I work with so many people around, like they're starting and they're really excited about hearing these new signals from their body and, and and befriending their hunger and befriending things like satisfaction. But there's oftentimes a disconnect between wanting to be able to get their needs met and actually being able to get their needs met. Oh my gosh. Yes. That's, and it's the sad thing about this as a, as a parent of young kids is I am starting to really realize just how, you know, and this isn't dogging my own parents or previous generations of parents, just we aren't taught this, right? We aren't taught how to figure out a, what we're feeling and what we need and then B how to, how to meet those needs it seems so basic, like, how are we doing anything other than that? But there's a real lack of kind of cultural, a cultural level of competency around, around these ideas of the interoceptive awareness and responsiveness. It's not something we're very good at culturally, I think. No, not at all. And I was kind of hit in the face with this of like, um, what, what are the obstacles that are preventing people from not only feeling their feelings, not physical, biological feelings, but also emotional feelings. And then the more interesting question is, and what are the obstacles preventing them from processing that or, or addressing it or meeting their needs? And I think that's where, again, I came back to the idea of shame and self-compassion is like, I love Kristen Neff's work on self-compassion because she talks about the difference between self-compassion and self-care is like self-compassion. You're always, you always have access to, whereas sometimes self-care we, we don't always have access to, right? You know, I, I might be sitting in a car and I could be feeling really like kind of lightheaded and hungry or, you know, um, I could be feeling maybe tired. I can't just lay down and take a nap if I'm sitting in the middle of traffic, right? Like I I probably need to be getting better sleep in general if I'm feeling constantly tired all the time, although that's a whole other conversation. But the example of like, but I always have access to self-compassion, even when I'm sitting in traffic in the car was such a game changer for me because I think oftentimes there's so much emphasis put on tangible things Um, which I think are incredibly important and people need to be getting fed enough and getting their physical needs met. And that's a big part of it. And I love your, you know, meal planning, um, program. I think it's great. I think, I think people need actually more non-diet tangible resources, but I also think people need more, um, just moment to moment resources of like when I'm in a shame spiral or when I'm, when I'm sitting in that car feeling hungry, I may not have access to food that minute, but I can meet myself with compassion because what, what I was hearing from clients is like, Oh, and then I, I'm so stupid. I forgot to pack snacks. And then I was like feeling way too hungry. And then I knew I was going to go home and I was going to feel really ravenous. And I feel like because I didn't pack snacks, I like wasn't, I didn't like plan good enough. And I wasn't like intuitively eating that day. And I'm like, no, you can you can have access to your self-compassion in that moment of like being kind to yourself, speaking kindly to yourself. And my favorite part of the self-compassion work is like common humanity of like, can you look around and see that there's probably a hundred other people on this highway right now that are feeling hungry and are, you know, bummed that they didn't pack a snack? Well, right. And and also, I mean, I, I'm not trying to nitpick this example you're giving, but also like can we also meet ourselves with like permission to just have a feeling in our body that doesn't need to have this huge judgmental side to it, right? Like would, would you need to pee? Are you super mad at yourself if like you don't have a toilet there right away? You just say, okay, noted next. I'm going right. to, I'm going to make that happen. Uh, and, and I think it might feel like we're kind of going in the weeds here, but truly 
that whole hunger thing of of feeling so much judgment about it or fear Mm -hmm. or shame or whatever I think that that's a really tangible example that everybody listening can relate to we've all felt hunger and can we meet those those types of things with a little bit of compassion and gentleness and care rather than so much judgment I think is a is a good way to practice this skill of of you know maybe it will manifest in bigger ways eventually but like even just right here right now in your body can you meet yourself with a little bit of gentleness that then can extend as a skill into other areas I think that's so brilliantly said. And I think that's, that's one of the other parts of the self-compassion, right? Is like the mindfulness. Mindfulness is just paying attention on purpose kind of without judgment, you know, like, can you just be like, yep, that's the feeling I'm having. I don't necessarily need to do anything to fix it right now. Um, I have this fantasy of kind of creating a program where we go through all of the 10 intuitive eating principles, but they're all with like, so like honor your hunger while rejecting diet mentality, you know, challenging the food police while rejecting diet mentality. Because I think there's this misunderstanding that you reject the diet mentality once, and then that's enough to sustain you for the rest of your life. And really when I hear reject the diet mentality, it's really like, it's like, uh, understanding shame and being self-compassionate like that. Yeah. And it's ongoing and it yeah. morphs and it shifts through phases of life and through, <laughs> yeah. So it's an, yeah, it's forever. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, can I, can I run a business with, while, while rejecting the diet yeah, mentality? Yeah, exactly. Like with, you know, understanding shame. Can I, it's really a befriending process. It's really, I, 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 you know, I'm just, you know, can, can I do this while befriending the diet mentality, which means like, I don't, I don't want to hang out with it, but I know it's there. It's really this idea of like, I I thought that the diet mentality was going to go away. And I think that's where people are feeling really stuck of like, I thought I was just going to never have the desire to want to lose weight again. Or I thought I was never going to have the craving to restrict my food again. Or I thought I was never going to, you know, miss a meal and then eat till I was uncomfortably full. And I'm like, I'm so sorry that you've gotten that impression (laughs) about this work because it's really a befriending process. It's like befriending all the parts of you and all the realities of life and like sitting with them. I love, I love that, um, poem, the guest house by Rumi. Cause I love that too. Yeah. It's like, can we just, can we just like open the door, understand that all these things are going to be there. And then when we're really clear on our values and, and our, our desires and our intentions, we can then move forward in alignment with those values. But I think people get so caught up in this, this sense of failure because they still have lingering doubts or shames or guilts or fears. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Linda, what's popping into my head right now is I'm really interested to hear kind of as you were thinking about coming back on the podcast and like having a part two discussion about this concept of enoughness, given what you've explained about what it was like for you after the last one. I'm interested to know kind of like what's your mentality moving toward moving forward into the phase of, okay, we've recorded it. We're waiting to release it. Things are going to come up for me. Like what's your (laughs) How are you thinking about that right now? What's my game plan for after we record this one? Yeah, so you don't annoy me. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) That's not where I'm coming from. But just like I'm interested to know kind of like how you're approaching that. I think what it – I think the big difference between the last one and this one is I – went into this, I went back and I reread Daring Greatly and I reacquainted myself with shame and how to, um, you know, kind of, for me, it feels really resonant to use that language of like befriend it, which is not like I want to, I love it or I agree with it. Some people might use the word accept. I accept that shame is just going to be part of my life. Um, so one of the key components is like knowing what your shame triggers are. And so I think the difference between last time and this time is like, I know that this may trigger shame and when and if it it does happen, I'm going to be like, there it is. I knew it was coming. And then I'm going to like sit with it and I'm going to process it with a trusted friend or professional. I'm going to challenge the things that feel really true. It's going to continue. I'm going to continue to hold myself accountable to like, how can I best support this work? How can I pop? How can I best be 
you know, recognizing my blind spots and addressing yeah. them. But I, it's the spiral that I want to avoid. Yeah. So I know I, I know I can't avoid the feeling. I can't avoid any feeling ever. There's no way to do that with anything. But I can choose whether I let it kind of spiral me down or spiral me up. Oh, that's so awesome. Oh, my gosh. I love that so much. Um, what else do you want to add? What else have we not talked about that you wanted to touch on today? I mean, I think I just really wanted to, I wanted to share my story because I've shared it personally with some people and, and it felt really, um, they, they seem to resonate with it. So if, if it just resonates with one other person, um, I'm willing to do that. So I wanted to share my story and I really wanted to talk about how I was able to use this experience to not only help myself, but also help the work, you know, of like being in service of the work of like when I'm doing, I love the idea, Carl Jung's idea of kind of like the wounded healer, um, of like, I am a wounded healer and I'm not ashamed of that anymore. Whereas I think I used to fall under the the very harmful systems of oppressions, ideas of like, if you're going to be good at something, you need to be perfect at it. And I, I just really want to fight back against that. There's a Pema Chodron quote that it says, um, compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It is a relationship between equal equals. And only when we know our own darkness, can we be present with the darkness of others? Compassion becomes real when we recognize our shared humanity. And that was really a game changer for me to be like, I had to sit with my own darkness because it was there and I just wasn't addressing it. And now that I know that that darkness is there, when I see those shadows, I can then be more present and more um, capable in session with clients. That's so beautifully said. I love that Pema Chodron quote. That's Mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. So thank you for this opportunity, Paige. I'm really grateful. You're welcome. Linda, I just... Thank you so much for sharing so much of your process here. I think I think there's so much that people will resonate with, you know, whether they're thinking about it in terms of food or body or work or professional life or home life or whatever it might be. I think it's I just love how how connective this work is in in terms of like, okay, Whatever's most in your face right now, you can you work on that, and then those skills you learn there, then will permeate out into other arenas, and you can always draw from skills and strength that you've re- that you've learned in the past to kind of help you move forward in the present. And this was such a good example of that, and I'm just so glad to be a part of your part of little part of your process here. <laughs> Thanks I'm for so trusting great. us again. Yeah, I'm thank I'm thankful for you and this opportunity and for the platform I've been given and um and I just really I hope it connects with someone so so they can feel a little bit more at peace and they can, you know, slay the shame shame dragon. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, um just remind people of how they can get in touch with you. So everything's under my name, Linda Tucker Coaching on Instagram. Um, Linda Tucker Coaching is my website, and they can just email me at Linda Tucker Coaching at Gmail. Okay, and I'll link to your website, and people can find the links there. Thanks so much, Linda, for joining me. It was great to talk with you. Thank you so much. Well, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed this conversation. If you haven't already, please go ahead and leave a review on iTunes. Thanks again so much for listening and we'll see you soon for another episode.